Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a teaching on the fear of the Lord. And this is a five-part album that I've got out. It's a brand new teaching. We're on the third teaching in that series, and this is entitled, They Wouldn't Bend, Budge, Bow, or Burn. And, of course, we're talking about the Hebrew children in Daniel chapter 3. I'm right in the middle of this teaching, so I'm not going to do a lot of review today, but hopefully you're aware of this story that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they feared the Lord, God gave them favor, they were promoted, and they were actually some of the main leaders over the entire kingdom of Babylon, the Assyrian uh, or the Babylonian Empire. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar made this image that was very tall, as, as 50 or 100 feet tall or something. It was a huge image made of gold, and he wanted everybody to bow down and worship it. And so here were these leaders in his kingdom who when the music played, they wouldn't bend, budge, bow, or burn. They wouldn't respond. And so he brought them and says, if you will bow down when you hear this music, I won't throw you into the fiery furnace, but if you continue to defy, defy me, I'm going to burn you to death. And who is the God who is able to deliver you out of our hands? And here's what they said in Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And at the end of our program yesterday, I was explaining. Some people have taken this as them wavering in their faith. In the 17th verse, they made this bold proclamation that God is able and he is going to deliver us from you. And then in the 18th verse, they said, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And some people see that as unbelief or a wavering. And... Um, Honestly, I don't even want to dignify that by going into that, but I think it is necessary to explain that just because something is God's will, not God's will doesn't automatically come to pass. And there's lots of reasons for this, but especially when you're dealing with other people. Did you know that the same God who delivered Peter from prison is the same God who let James, the brother of John, die at the hands of Herod? in prison. It's the same God who let John the Baptist be beheaded in prison. When it comes to persecution, we aren't redeemed from persecution. I believe that, um, you know, the Lord, they expressed their faith that God was going to deliver them, but you just can't guarantee that God is going to stop all persecution. Matter of fact, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you aren't persecuted, it's because you aren't living godly. If you are living godly, there are people who've been martyred for their faith. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, he wasn't an ungodly man. He was a man filled with the Holy Ghost. And he had the Lord appear unto him, and the Lord was standing on the Father's right hand. Every place else in Scripture, it talks about him seated at the Father's right hand. I believe he was honoring Stephen, the very first person put to death for their faith in the risen Lord Jesus. You can't guarantee that God is going to deliver everybody. You know, I mentioned on our program yesterday that we're having resistance towards us building this new CBC campus, and a lot of that is persecution. A lot of it is just carnal things, but we've had the gay and lesbians turn out and say that we hate gay and lesbians, which isn't true. We've been persecuted. We've been maligned. We've had things said about us. And you know what? Things like this just happen, and they're hindrances. I've told people, I said, I believe we are going to get done what God tells us to do, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be without opposition. And yet I find that there are people who think. they have. I don't even know where they got this from. It certainly didn't get it from the Bible. But they think that if they are doing God's will, that everything just works out smoothly and that there is no opposition. And if there's opposition, then they wonder about, did I miss God? 
Actually, I don't think you ought to interpret God's will by carnal, external things. You ought to go by your personal relationship with God and what God tells you. But if you were going to evaluate circumstances and use that to tell you whether or not you're in God's will, it actually would be more scripturally correct to say that if everything goes wrong, you must be in the will of God. For instance, let me just turn over and read this uh, passage of script. Well, I won't read it because it, of time. But let me just refer to it in Acts chapter 16 that Paul and Silas were going around preaching the gospel and they saw in a vision a man saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And so they woke up in the morning and knew that God had sent them to Macedonia. And within days, just a matter of hours of being over in Macedonia, they were arrested, they were beaten because of their preaching of the gospel, and they were put in the Philippian jail in the stocks in the lowest part of the prison. Did you know, according to many people's theology, they would be saying, well, what did we do wrong? I thought God told us to come over here. He did tell them to go over there, but that does not mean you aren't going to have opposition. You know, I can make a parallel here. I was in the Army, and the Army sent me to Vietnam. And because I was in Vietnam, I was shot at. I had bombs hit my bunker. There was a number of times that I should have died, and yet I didn't die. And some people would think, well, then you must not have been in the right place. No, our government sent us over there to fight a war. And when they put you into the warfare, they are, their goal isn't to get you killed. The goal is to see the enemy killed. But nonetheless, it puts you in a position of danger, and there are people that are killed. And instead of looking at them as you did something wrong, you shouldn't have died. No, we honor those people. We call them heroes because of they, they gave up their life for a cause. Well, in the spiritual realm, God has sent us into a hostile environment. He has sent us to go out and to proclaim His name, and He said that if you are living a godly life, you are going to suffer persecution, and not everything works the way that you want it to. And there is going to be persecution. And sometimes God delivers people out of the burning, fiery furnace. Other times people give up their lives. And it doesn't mean that one is godly and the other one was ungodly. One was standing in faith and the other one must have been in unbelief. Over in the book of Hebrews, it talks about all of these heroes of faith. And it, some, it says that some did not accept deliverance looking for a better resurrection. In other words, there might have even been an opportunity that they, they could have been delivered, but they just decided to stand for the Lord and use their faith as a testimony and as a witness. So anyway, I have no criticism whatsoever for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All they were saying is that we, our God is able. Nebuchadnezzar had said, who is the God who's able to deliver you out of my hand? Well, they said, our God is the one. He is bigger than you. He is able to deliver us. We believe he's going to deliver us, but we want you to know that even if things didn't work out the way that we are believing that they would, we still wouldn't serve you. And I tell you, I think that this is a great trait about the fear of the Lord, that you need to be committed to God, not just because of what he can do in your life and because you believe that everything is going to work out to your advantage. And I am not minimizing the fact that God does want to bless you. God does want to heal you, prosper you, and give you joy and peace and give it to you more abundantly. I am not trying to minimize that at all. But we are in a hostile world. Not everything that works the way that it should. And you know what? I'm committed to God even if everything doesn't work the way that I want it to. I've had good friends of mine die who shouldn't have died. It was not God's will for them to die. Sometimes I understand why it happens because it's just obvious that there was a problem somewhere. But other times I still don't understand. I don't understand everything. And see, some people even take my admission that I don't understand everything as some, somehow or another me wavering in my faith and doing these kind of things. I'm just telling you, I don't understand everything, but I know God is a good God. I've had the Lord prove that to me. I've seen proof of it and evidence in the things that are going on. And when I see something happen that doesn't line up with the things that I desire and the things that I even believe are God's will, it does not make me turn against God. I'm talking to people right now. I bet you there are millions of people 
watching this program who you believe for something, you asked God for something and it didn't come to pass and because of it, you're mad at God. You feel like God let you down. You know what? I'm just saying you don't have a real fear of the Lord. You were committed to God as long as everything goes the way that you want it to go. And I'm telling you, God's will doesn't just automatically come to pass. We have to cooperate. Sometimes it's our doubt and unbelief that stops God from operating. Sometimes it's other people. Stephen, when he was stoned to death, it wasn't his unbelief that caused him to die. It was other people persecuting him. And if the Lord would have just struck all of his persecutors dead and have stopped this persecution, we would have missed Saul, who became the apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament. God would have just killed him. The Lord doesn't always take away your problems, not because it's His will for you to suffer, but because there's other people involved and God isn't going to just strike every person who comes out against you with deafness or blindness or strike them dead. Sometimes you're going to endure some problems. And you know what? If you have a true fear of the Lord, you'll be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you'll say, this is what we believe. God can do it. We believe He's going to do it. But even if everything doesn't work out, I still will not bend or bow. I am going to serve God regardless of the consequences. I'm going to serve God when it's to my advantage. I'm going to serve God when it's not to my advantage. I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking through me to many people all around the world, that your commitment to God is a fair weather commitment as long as everything is going your way. But here is a situation where these people were facing death. And you know what? They were still committed to God. There's many people today that all, the only thing that you suffer is just a glance. People maybe not associating with you the way that they wanted to. They talk about you at the water cooler and drop your name behind uh, behind your back and there's a little bit of rejection or you might have somebody yell at you and say that you're a bigot or something because you have a set of standard and morality and you don't just cave in. And there's a lot of people that aren't even committed to God enough to stand up to that. No physical harm being done to you. You know, I got a letter recently from a woman in Iran and she was uh, unable to give me her address and give me her name. She snuck this out, but she was talking about how the, there are friends of hers that are put to death for their faith in the Lord and uh, that she has been punished and that things have happened. And I mean, those people are facing physical death and yet they're standing for the Lord. And yet there's people watching this program that you won't stand for your own convictions because you're afraid that somebody may not like you. They may not vote you to be the most popular or whatever. I tell you what, that's not a very strong fear of the Lord. That's not a very strong commitment to the Lord. If you want to see things change, and it doesn't take, it doesn't take hundreds of thousands of people rising up. You know what, in this situation, here was a kingdom. The Babylonian Empire basically dominated the world at this time. And there was four people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then Daniel, who stood up to this king and they wouldn't compromise. They operated in the fear of the Lord. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar was completely transformed. Nebuchadnezzar wrote the fourth chapter of Daniel. It's the only non-Jewish king to write a part of the Bible. And man, he glorified God and said, those who walk in pride, he is able to abase. All of this happened because just four people stood up to him. Actually, up to this time in the fourth chapter, it was only three people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that stood up to him, and they turned an entire king and kingdom around. And then later, Darius, and then Cyrus, kings of Persia that conquered the Babylonian empire, they came in, and they issued this order to go rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And miraculous things happened because these four people stood their ground you know, the same thing would happen here in the United States if people would stand up with a fear of the Lord. I'm not saying that you wouldn't be brought on the carpet. I'm not saying that you wouldn't be threatened to take your tax exemption away. You wouldn't be threatened with some kind of a thing or whatever. 
But you know what? If we would just stand our ground and stand up for the truth and speak the truth, God could still use just a few individuals today to turn this nation around, to turn whatever nation you live in around. It could happen today. It's not God that's changed. It's not the God of Daniel that's changed. It's the Daniels of God that have changed. We just aren't standing and using this. And so when they made this declaration and said, we still aren't going to serve you regardless of what you do. If you put us to death, we will not bow down to you. We do not fear you. We fear God. It says, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage was changed. The word visage means face. His face changed. I believe that all of the demons that this guy was possessed with came up in his face. And he commanded them to heat the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been. He took the mightiest men in his army and wrapped them in coats and in hoses and things to protect their flesh and had them bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then he used these powerful men to throw them into the fire. And the men who were throwing them into the fire were killed by the fire before they even got Daniel, I mean Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the fire. And these three Hebrews fell down, bound into the fire. And then the king looked over into this furnace to see what had happened. And the Hebrew children were not bound anymore. They were loose. They were walking around in the fire with no harm. And there was a fourth person in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar looked at him and said that he looked like the Son of God. I have no idea how he would recognize the Son of God, but apparently it was some kind of a supernatural-looking being. Many people think that this was the Lord Jesus himself that walked in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or at least a mighty angel. And when Nebuchadnezzar saw this, he cried unto him and asked them to come forth. And they came out of the fire, and there wasn't even a smell of smoke on them. Their hair hadn't even been singed. Their clothes weren't damaged. And yet the men who threw them in, bound in all this protective gear, were destroyed by the fire and died. I mean, it was an absolute unqualified miracle. And you know how this happened? Because some people had the fear of the Lord and refused to compromise. There are many people watching this program who want the miraculous intervention of the Lord. You want God to change your family, to change your workplace, to change your church. You want God to perform a miracle and do something and change the situation, and yet you're afraid to stand. You're more afraid of men than you are of God. And I'm telling you, they wouldn't have seen this miracle happen if they hadn't have been committed to God even to the point of death. Everybody's wanting to use their faith to get out of the fire instead of to go through the fire. And God may have you go through some persecution and there may be some people who criticize you and you might lose your job. You might be reprimanded. You might be kicked out of a church. I've been kicked out of two or three churches. I was talking to the Lord about that one time and talking about God. They kicked me out of the church and the Lord told me, he says, don't worry, they kicked me out of that same church. <laughs> and you know what? I guarantee you might suffer some things. But if you would just stand your ground God will promote you. God can use these things. A miracle can take place. When the, when the uh, disciples were going across the Sea of Galilee, it's normally just a two-hour trip across that sea, and yet about eight to ten hours into this, they were still only halfway across because the wind was blowing against them. You know, if they wanted just for safety, they could have turned the boat around, put the sail up, and with that wind being that hard against them, they could have been back to shore in just a few minutes. But to their credit, they were going the direction that God told them to go. Even at the cost of their life, they were still out there when they could have run, when they could have gone back to shore. They were still headed in the direction that God told them. And then is when the miracle happened and Jesus walked on the water and Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus. Everybody wants these kind of miracles, but the first time it gets a little tough, the first time the wind blows against them, they just turn the boat around, head for shore and take the easiest way out and then wonder why God didn't come through. The miracle is going to be out there doing what God told you to do. The miracle is going to be when you stand and say, we aren't going to bend, budge, bow, or burn. 
we are not going to give in to this, and then you stand your ground, then is when the Lord comes through. There are some of you that are wondering, why hasn't God delivered me? It's because you aren't taking a stand. It's because you haven't stood up. After all of this happened, look at what Nebuchadnezzar did. It says in verse uh, 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains and the, of the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their heads sins, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their homes shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. You know, it's amazing. Rather than just totally humbling himself and worshiping God, uh, he took his authority and wanted to kill any person who came against them, which isn't the right reaction. But it does show a complete change of heart from this arrogancy where he says, who is the God that can deliver you out of my hand? And he humbled himself and acknowledged it. In the next chapter, you find that he had another dream. Daniel came and interpreted his dream and told him that what this means is that because of your arrogance and because you don't recognize that it's God who's given you this position, then you are going to be driven from men and you're going to be like an animal for seven years. Your hair is going to grow so long it's going to be like fur. Your fingernails are going to grow like claws and you will literally eat grass and you are going to be out of your mind going about as an animal for seven years. And Daniel counseled him and he says, if you would humble yourself, God would lengthen your, your peace. But... Nebuchadnezzar didn't do it. He went ahead and he was standing in Babylon. You know, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon were one of the uh, wonders, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And he was standing there looking on all of this, of what he had made, and he took credit for it. And there was a voice came from heaven. For seven years he acted like an animal. Then God restored the kingdom to him. His mind came back. He was promoted to be king. And here's Nebuchadnezzar's statement at the end of this story. He wrote that fourth chapter. In verse 37, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. What an understatement. And you know what? All of this began with the Hebrew children taking a stand, the fear of the Lord came to him, and eventually God did all of these things because some people stood up and honored God more than they honored people. Andrew's complete teaching titled, The Fear of the Lord, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD, or if you prefer, you can get the DVD as seen on TV. Each is available for a gift of any amount. Remember to specify CD, DVD, or DVD as seen on TV when you contact us. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awmi.net and click on Audio Teachings on the left-hand side of the page. The third audio teaching in today's series is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this third CD titled, They Wouldn't Bend, Budge, Bow, or Burn Free of Charge. We'd also like to remind you that Andrew's book titled, Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith, has been released in paperback. It's available for a gift of any amount. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. 
Helpline hours are Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. until 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. If the lines are busy, you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awmi.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I had grown up with God puts us through things to make us stronger people. You get healed if it's God's will. And if you don't get healed, then he wants you to go through it. Listening to things that people said, like, you know, God's trying to teach you something. He doesn't heal everybody, he heals some people. I heard people talking at church about, you know, God had a different plan and God made me sick. Because the way I was raised, God would get you. I felt like God had, that God had punished me. The church I grew up in was big on just performance. I was such a law-based, legalistic person and didn't even know it. Really devastated with legalism. I was operating in a law mindset. I had a law perspective. Always being focused uh, on the law. Deep into religion. I grew up in church. I was raised in church. A denomination that was very legalistic. I came from a Baptist background. I come from a Catholic. I was raised a preacher's kid. I was a missionary kid, grew up on the mission field taught the Bible my whole life, got saved at four years old. And I had been in and out of church since I was five years old. I was saved when I was eight, and I was saved just to stay out of hell. Saved and stuck. Until we heard about Andrew Walnick, and he began to explain. And Andrew just countered all of that with the Bible. No one had ever explained those scriptures so beautifully. It's just made me over on the inside. It's I'm totally different. I'm a different person. And when I finally seen the truth, it was just, it was awesome. And it still to this day is just amazing. His teaching was freeing. It grabbed my heart because I had never heard that our sins were not imputed to us, not put to our account. This makes sense. The Bible makes sense to me. And he's ringing true to what I'm reading in the Bible. She didn't have to perform in order to gain a relationship with God that He loved you. It took the religion out of it and made it all about relationship. And then everything you've studied for your whole life, all of a sudden it comes into sync. It's like, pow. The Spirit came over and just went, whoo, and it all lined up. That clicked and all of a sudden things became so real and so understandable. And you get this revelation on the inside of you. And I wept. I sat on the side of the road and I wept. All of a sudden, the Bible made sense. And now, I live in the blessings of God. My life just changed, and it changed for the better. Life has just gotten better and better. Life is good when you have hope. And God is just good. We have a life now that we've never had before in every area. What I found was victory, where we didn't have any before. I really am grateful that he submitted to the Lord because I'm reaping the results of it.